This documentary is an attempt to tell the life of an iconic Irish hero, a patriot, a freedom fighter, more importantly a brother, a son, a friend and a comrade. On the 2nd of August 1981, at 7.15, the life of Kieran Doherty ended. Having spent 73 days on hunger strike, the second hunger strike that he had undertaken in a very short period. A 26 year old from Anderson's town. Wherever Irish people gather, Kieran Dockery and the other hunger strikers that give their lives in the cause of Irish freedom is known. But perhaps what isn't known is who was Kieran Dockery? What was his background? What did he like? What did he not like? What did he do? What was he good at? And I'm joined this afternoon with Terry and Michael, two brothers who hopefully will be able to tell us some of that background. We have deliberately chose the PD club in Andersons Town, a club that is synonymous with the Dockerty family, to try and set the scene of how a young man from this community finds himself in the hellhole of Long Case. So both of you are welcome to the programme. Thank you. And I know that you have done, both of you have done numerous interviews and you've travelled the country both during the hunger strike and after the hunger strike talking about the injustice that was done to the prisoners. But as a young man and as a brother, tell us a bit about Kieran. Was he, was he older than you, younger than you, mischievous? Uh, well, Terry, can we start, let's start with Terry okay. first. Okay. Kieran was my younger brother. Um, me and him shared a room in the house. Uh, as Michael did for quite a while. As Michael got older, he moved to his grandparents' house. But me and Karen uh, shared a room, and with being two brothers, sometimes that didn't go well. Mm -hmm. We always had a wee bit of conflict, but it got on fairly well, you know. Uh, played the normal games, football, hurling in the field, chases, rounders, all the games you played when you were kids, you know. Uh, he was a good brother. There was, uh, he, 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 he was a... Uh, he was just a, a nice guy. He's just, he was just your brother. You know, like any other brothers, they, they always had that bit of, um, you, you had fun and then you had your, your arguments and stuff like that there. But in general, we got all well. Michael, uh, you were the older brother. Yes, that's right. Were you the sensible one? Uh, yes, I had to break them up fighting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Cameron's the third brother, but uh, then I had the, the two sisters on that, and Brenton came later. Uh, I was the eldest, but the three brothers were very close together. We were a year apart. I, I was born 53, Terry 54, and Kieran 55. W was he a hard young man to control in uh, the house, or was he well mannered or no, bad mannered? No, no, or he, no he was, I would say Kieran was well mannered, and uh, Terry was more of a, a mischievous one, <laughs> mischievous one. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes when they had a wee bit of a row, I somebody helped sort it out a wee bit, you know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But Kieran, he uh, uh, had a his childhood uh, was a happy childhood. Uh, the, our house was on top of Camita Field there, and the big field on the slope we used to play. Or Terry, Kieran, and uh, sisters would play football, Harlot and Camogie, all different things around us on the on the Camita Green there. So I did, and I would remember then, when we were younger, Terry will probably remember this too, my daddy would have, he had a, my daddy worked for Limer Trinidad at the time of Tyler, but he had a, a company car, a Ford Anglia estate, and we would have piled into the car on a good Saturday or Sunday. Uh, Mommy made the sandwiches and biscuit tin, and, and uh, we would have headed to Trala Beach, where we spent the whole day at Trala Beach, with playing Terry football, swimming, I don't know, and I still remember Kieran would never left the ball out of his hand. He always wanted to play football. Uh, but my daddy would have, because he was a floor tailor and used a blow lump, he used to heat the water and soup with a blow lump. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask, Terry. I know the journey, the Dockery journey. You know, you were in jail, and uh, Michael was in jail. And I know your family has been kind of steeped in Republican history. And, and I know that come from this part of Belfast when the conflict broke out 
like many families, you were just absorbed in, in the whole thing. Did you ever, in your childhood growing up, did you ever kind of, leaving the side, the, the hunger strike, did you ever, was it foreseen that you would all, that three out of, out of your family would end up in jail? Or was that something that it just no. kind of circumstances propelled you? That was, that was something out of our control at the start uh, of circumstances that came around and we were drawn into it as hundreds of people were at that time. But our, our life growing up was just a normal family life, as Michael says. Weekends away to Tirala Beach, playing football in the field, playing rally over chalky, jumping the river, falling in the river, trying to get clean before getting home for your mag gets it, look at your good shoes. The typical stuff that kids do, you know, me and Karen having a disagreement in the field over football, having a dig. Mrs. Dockery, they're at it again. And, you know, this sort of type of parts that we were growing up in younger life, which just just normal blurs, you know, and we get on like that. But as time went on, the troubles broke out. And I remember very well, it was 1969. I was working on the old park road, a place in the Deer Park, and I had to travel across town, cycle down the falls, over Agnes Street, up Manor Street, and up on to the, the old park. And I remember the day cycling down, and the place was in turmoil. The whole place was on fire. And I, had, I couldn't get to work, I had to turn back. And this was the start, yeah. you know what I mean? I remember the, the Brits coming in. I remember sitting on the back of their Jeeps, as Karen did, and took us a jaunt around on the back tailgate of the Jeep, sitting my legs dangling on, letting this look through the sights of the, of the rifles. Little did you know, six weeks later, things would have blew up the way they did. And those same rifles would be pointed at your community? Yes, them same rifles mm -hmm. would have been pointed, yeah. Michael has, yes. has mentioned, uh, and you have mentioned your mother, and I, I had the privilege of knowing both your mother and your father. And your mother, for anyone who had never had that, that privilege of meeting her, was a very gentle woman. She was a very uh, male-mannered woman. So in the middle of Anderson's town, you have a family growing up, a very respectable family. You have all of a sudden, or what appears to be all of a sudden, the regular raids to the family home. And the Dockerys were singled out, uh, not least of all because of used to, but also because of Cairn mm -hmm. at a very early age. Can you remember the early raids in the home? Can you remember that period when the British Army raided the house? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, at that time, I had moved over to McGranny, McGranny's, because uh, uh, McGranny had a bad heart and granted a taxi, so I sort of was there that's how I started staying there, that I got off there at night and stuff. But I had a couple of raids in Bing and Drive, and I remember the Brits coming in and uh, coming in. And the first, the only thing, first thing I remember was the door coming off the hinges and they pulled me out of bed uh, and into the Saris. And my granda said he would go with me down to the barracks and stuff. So that was one of the raids. But I wasn't in a Camita Drive. When what, what, what age? What age were you then? Uh, 17. And your mommy's side, can you remember the raids in your mommy's side? Uh, yeah, there was, there was quite a few. Uh, one, again, I was arrested two or three times, brought to Castlereagh. Uh, Kieran also Castlereagh. Uh, I remember them lifting floorboards. Uh, my dad saying, go with that bread. They were searching different parts of the house. So my dad was saying more or less, go and keep an eye on case the planted stuff like out there, just walk around. But most day, most times when the press came, they held you in the living room, you weren't allowed to move. Uh, at one stage, they left the place, and looking back on it now, it, it was a funny thing that happened. The mum went up to bed after the raid, we were tidying around the house, and the next thing the scene came in. They left the floorboards up, and at that time they'd only lino on the floors. So my mum went into the bedroom, she fell through the floor, and her leg came down <laughs> to <laughs> into the living room. <laughs> this is, you know, okay, it was serious at the time, but when you look back, you know, you can laugh at these three things, but yes, you know. Your mother um, didn't come from this part of the world. She didn't come from the Andersons' no, town area. No. 
how did she adjust, you know, to to this this ongoing and constant harassment of her family, who she loved, the bits loved dearly. Like, did she manage well? Did was it was she frightened? Was she frightened for you? Was it? Well, she, she never showed that that she was frightened. But I'm sure, like any parent, when we went out during the day, going to work. You could have been assassinated, you, you know, the Brits could arrest you at any stage, you could be battened, you know, uh, you know, parents will worry, but she didn't show it to us, no. Uh, she, she was a lovely mum, dinner's on the table every night, six o'clock, and for your dinner, you know what I mean, and there was no right. Sunday dinner, it was just, uh, not, as again, as a, we were just a family, we got on like a family, all, uh, even though the troubles were on. Family, we got on with it. The family life was still family life. No, uh, but there wasn't any changes, you know. Dinner was still at six o'clock. Doesn't matter if the Brits were going to come in later on that night, or there was a shooting down the street, or there was something going on, ratting. You knew that dinner was right at six, so you went home. When, when, I, when I look around photographs of, of Cairn, and I'm sure these are all good looking. Uh -huh. I'm sure all these were good looking. I think one of the things that strikes you about Kieran is the, he, he almost looks like a rock star. He yeah. looks like a rock star or a folk star uh, in the early, mid 60s, early 70s. That long hair and that dress. Um, what they used to say in Belfast, was he fond of himself? Did he, was he, was he, uh, did he know he was good looking? <laughs> That's a, I, I don't know. I don't, that's, to be honest with you, he, he looked after himself. He had this thing when he was had he always like the push his hair back, he, and it was like he'd done this. It was like a habit. Mm -hmm. He, you know, checked himself out. Of course, going out at night. Uh, you know, once we came to the ages of coming to a bar and having a drink, uh, certainly he, he dolled himself up, and there was yeah, there was girls. Uh, Chasing him, you know what I mean? It would have been one of them ones where yeah, yeah. he I wouldn't have to do too aye. much chasing. Yeah, you know, well, so. well he, w he would have wore uh, as the jeans well pressed uh, and the Ben Sherman shirt and the V neck jumper and the, the nice jacket and the, uh, the Oxford shoes, highly polished. So I remember, remember when he, that's when he went to school out, of course. When he was uh, maybe operating, he was wearing different gear. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I, I would imagine. I think my mummy. Uh, uh, she, they used to take us every Sunday to Mass, we never missed Sunday to Mass, but as uh, the tournament came in and seen 69 and raid in the house, my mummy supported, she seen the injustice and uh, what the British were up to and uh, she, she supported Kieran, Terence and myself and the family and she got more, more what you call republic, republic mm -hmm. and then, so that's how she got into that. And, uh, I think Kieran, one of the turning points in Kieran was he seen 69, 69. He seen the tournament and his second cousins were shot dead in the Lower Falls, Maura Macon yes, and Dorothy McGuire. Yeah. So I think they were turning points in Kieran's life. The, the reason I'm asking the question, and I see you smiling when I'm asking you that, is that for most people, you know, when we talk about Kieran Doherty, sometimes we forget he, when he died. He was twenty-six. He yeah. was he was active in Republican politics from he was fifteen. Uh, he had been on the run to avoid to avoid uh, arrest for a period when he was very 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 young. And of course, like Michael and yourself, he was also interned. And I think it's almost beyond most people's comprehension that a man who loves life, or a boy, or a young man who loves life would take such decisions, you know, lately. That was the reason I was asking you that question. I, I want to return, uh, the Doherty's as well has been renowned for being Republicans, are also renowned for their sporting ability. And before we started this interview, you were talking about cycling, and, and I know Michael yeah, football, I, was a, a keen sportsman. Was Kieran in the sport? I mean, apart from fighting yes, with you on the yes, field? Yes, well, uh, Kieran was into the Gaelic football in the early days. He played, played for the primary school, uh, he played for the secondary school, and big Brian White mm -hmm. did midfield with him, and he says he was a tremendous fielder of the ball. He was in power with John McCairn, who was an Antrim star, yeah. and Kieran would have probably became an Antrim star, 
But I have started to get into cycling, but cycling, uh, but the brother riding tours, but the brothers made me go and play matches. <laughs> uh, and our pitch was on the Glen Road beside Crossing Passion School up beside the brewery, and it was on a slope. And there was rushes in the field and blackthorn bushes round. So if you got a dunt into the hedge, you come out with thorns on you. But it was the under 16 championship matches, and I would have been doing midfield. I was 16 and under 16. Kieran was only 14, turning 14, and he was in that team. And he could hold us all against anybody. So uh, I used to hit the ball out to Kieran and then back to me and whatever. We worked together. But then I went, a double I, I went into a sink, but he would have turned out. There's a famous photograph of the trees. His minor team off that. He won a minor medal in 71. And he must have been maybe, didn't want his photograph. Everybody's looking at the camera and he has his head turned at the camera. So he did not want photo his photograph. Uh, yes, yes. And he did a wee bit of segment. Turns, turns was into the segment. But Kieran came along on an older type bike. Our bikes were handed down. Like I uh, got a new bike handed, the one down to turns to Kieran. Uh, he was. He would have been a good cyclist too, wouldn't he, Terry? He, he was. Well. I, I remember um, we had a, our local club race would be at Gully's Gate out of the far side of Lurgan on the on the shores of Loch Ney. Uh, there was a circuit in around there, and there was a, a championship race one day. Kieran himself wasn't well for the week coming up this, but he wanted to ride this race. And he uh, he rode the race, he won the it, but my dad said to him, you're not well, you're not riding the race. But he did ride the race, and he was very determined to ride the race. And he finished third on the race. And it showed you some of his yeah. determination, you know, that it was all he's there. You know, there was wee silly things he'd done. I and mean, then looking back, we used to go to Falls Pass for a swim on a Saturday morning. Everybody back in the days, up down to Falls Pass and round the Candy's Bakery afterwards for the, the wee buns, the crust <laughs> buns, the bag of crust buns you got for 2p or something, yeah. whatever it was back in the day. But I remember us learning to swim and just starting off and Kieran this day and says, I'm going to do 20 lengths. He'd never swam 20 lengths before, you know, and we're going right, whatever. So off he went then. He done it, he needed to run, but he, but he was determined to finish his 20 lengths, and he did. Mm -hmm. And that's, so, that's, that's part of his, the genes in him, that, yeah. you know, he was always determined that if he started something, he would finish it, you know? I mentioned your mother, and uh, I hope I done her justice. Uh, and also a friend of mine as well as someone I knew was your father. And we're in the PD club, the father that, sorry, a club that your father was synonymous with. And of all the money that was owed to him, was ever paid to him, the Dockeries would be the richest family in Belfast because mm -hmm. if a club was supposed to make money, nobody told Alfie because he gave everybody strap. But if you were saying, you know, if you were kind of trying to judge who Cairn was like, I know physically you had your father say, had he your father's personality? Hmm. Um, uh, no, no, I, 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 uh, no, I, I don't think he had, I don't think my father, he had my father's personality. Uh, he had t two, I think he had two, well he was very, a very determined person and, and, and committed person and uh, he, he had, uh, well his personality, he, it would change. Uh, he had his group of friends, and he enjoyed a wee drink, but it was a Guinness, and had a bit of crack with his friends. And that, but uh, when then he was involved in on an operation or in a house, as uh, one of his colleagues told me, I said, "How do you describe Karen?" I said, "He was fearless, oh, fear, yeah. fearless." And he, his personality would change when they went into a house. He said he was so committed, he was frightening and so precise and want to plan every exact and every and everybody wanted would want to, to operate with Kieran because I knew he was he would have backed them up whatever was going on. You were going to say when I asked you the same question about his personality. Um, well, I would agree with Michael about that. You know, when he when he when he had to be in his bonnet, he, he was very focused and very. You wouldn't have shifted him. You know, he was he had a, if he whatever he was doing. He was focused, and he had a he had a scene of three, and that that was Brent, or that was uh, Kieran. But uh, as you said about my father, uh, no, definitely, uh, uh, Kieran had his own his own ways, you know. And I, I don't know where that came from, you know. 
I, I'm very forgiving and very, you know, my personality wouldn't be anywhere near Kieran's personality. He was a nice guy. Yeah. He would treat you well. You know, but if he had to say something, he, mm -hmm. he'd be straightforward and said. He wouldn't hide behind doors. That's the type of guy he was. You know, he would, he would call you out right away, you know, and that, that would be Kieran, you know. I want to move you on to, to that period of internment. You, I know you were both interned. Uh -huh. And Kieran was one of the last internees to be released. Despite his early age, he was one of the last internees to be released. Was there any sense when internment ended, was there any sense that his Republican activities, that he had done his bit, you know, right. he didn't need to do any more, that right. he needed to get on with his life, or was it always going to be the case in your opinion, yeah, yes, yes. Was it always going to be yeah, the case yeah. that he was going to throw himself back into the struggle? No, yes. it was always going to be the case that he was going to go straight, straight back. Uh, I spoke to somebody and he reported back within days, for a days. And I wasn't turned at the same time. I was case five, Karen was case four, and I would have went over and met him. And he, he, he was, he was committed. He says, "I'm going straight back for Irish freedom. I'm going to continue the fight." It was just a wee funny bit that thing that happened. Oh, an uh, I was in cage five and my, a tunnel was found, so we didn't get any food parcels for a week. And Kieran was in cage four, I was in cage five. I could see Kieran through the, the fence at night. So he got a food parcel together in a bag with a weight in it, and he tried to throw it from four, cage four to cage five. And I hit the electric wires and put the the power out in the camp. So uh, the boys didn't get any food and didn't get any tea uh, or anything that night. They would have killed me. So and there was no light. No, the reason I'm asking you that question is that it, it would have been quite understandable that having, at that age, having been interned, having been on the run, having been an active service volunteer, that when you get out of jail, that you said about getting a life for yourself. But you've explained work here in his head was, can I ask you, and I mentioned earlier on the harassment of the family. And the Doherty family were one of those families that were selected in Anderson's town for the regular raids. After internment, was there, did these raids, did they intensify or, or did they level off? Or, you know, how were the family treated, broadly speaking, by the British Army in the area? Well, you still got their normal stops. They knew who you were, uh, especially the Green Jackets. The Green Jackets seemed to target our house more than any other regiment. I don't know if that's because of the timing of Cairn being involved and us that early stages of the troubles. I mean, even myself walking down the street, you heard a, a, a whistle and it'd be Major Lloyd calling you back to search you. You know, you had to go to him, you know what I mean? He stayed, called you back. The the house, as I said, that was the green jackets who lifted the floorboards in the house. Uh, they also, you know, the comments they made in and around the house, you know, to your mother and stuff, uh, you know, degrading type of yeah. comments, mm -hmm. trying to wind the father up and yeah. stuff like this here. Just just the general, uh, they, they were just out to, to cause a bit of hustle in the house, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to cause a reaction, you know, to maybe make a rest. Kieran, nine times out of ten, Kieran wasn't there. Right. You know what I mean? Kieran, because Kieran, he was on the run. Because he was on the run. You know, the, but the houses were still being raided. I mean, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many times they were raided. But it was that over over a period of a year, it could have been ten times. Ten. Yeah. You know. Well, he, Kieran, he got out at, at November eight, seventy five, mm -hmm. and he was arrested in August seventy six. So I think then. The raids did ease off now because they knew he was on the run, he wasn't staying there. So they did ease off a bit because of that. Yeah. And he was involved in many operations. And, uh, the, the, the famous one is with Maria Farrell was caught and Sean McDermott was, was killed, Kieran was there and, and got, got away. Yes. In fact, there's a very famous photograph of Kieran while he's on the run. At, at, at the, the, the Glen Owen. Yes. Uh, looking into the, the yes. signal. Can I ask you, shortly after that period of back on Ramon, prolonged Ramon in the crumb, he finds himself, he finds himself in the blocks uh, and immediately he's on protest. 
how, how difficult was that for your mother and father? How anxious do you think that, that period? And I know they weren't the only family, but Karen seemed to have been singled out consistently for, for beaten by the screws, maybe because of his determination. So can you remember, conver were there conversations in the house where people, was your mother and father yeah. worried, frightened? Well, Karen put himself forward for some of the beatings. Explain I mean, that then, what you mean? Right. One, one time when he was on remand in the crumb, he was coming through the tunnel, and there was a young guy. He was getting hassled by the screws, and Kieran stepped in to protect him. The screws then attacked Kieran. Kieran took the beating for the young lad, and saved him getting a more vicious beating than he did. And that's what Kieran did. That uh, even a couple of times in the case itself, he had a couple of real bad beatings where. I mean, he should have been hospitalised and never was. You know, he was brutalised, as were all the rest of the boys in the case. Uh, and again, if they were going out to the wash rooms with their towels on, the degrading the, the, the part of that, you know, the screws making fun of them, laughing at them, mm -hmm. and stuff like this, maybe some young lad getting hassled, Kieran would have stepped in, and he 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 took quite a few beatings. And, uh, this Helping his comrades, you know. This might surprise you. I spoke to someone where we were getting ready to do this this conversation or to have this conversation. Someone who had been in jail in the blocks with Kieran, mm -hmm. and he said that he never ever seen Kieran either at mass or just by coincidence seen Kieran in the blocks. That he didn't have a cut, a black eye, yeah. uh, or a bruise yeah, around his face yeah, of yeah. some of some uh, description. And he said it was screws had made it their business to, to single them out. I mean, were you aware yeah. of that at the yeah. time? Yes, yeah. well, yes. Well, he, he would try, and visits with mummy and father, he would try to hide any of the torture and injustice he was receiving. And he would he would just have an ordinary visit. He would say he's doing okay. But from the very start, Kieran wouldn't conform with prisoners, he wouldn't, uh, with prison warders, uh, screws, he wouldn't speak to them. Uh, they would have to drag him out of the cell. Uh, the mirror searches, they would take six or eight of them to fight him. And when he did get a visit, he, when they say time up, he wouldn't go. So every, every day of every year, he fought them. It was like Bobby Sands says, I fought a monster today. But, they, but it comes back every day with this devil's care fought them every day of his life there. And they, Kieran was a big frame, six foot two, well yeah. built. So the warders would have singled them out, but what would they have done that, uh, if they were doing a block, sh uh, a, a wing shift, where they dragged them all out? They'd hit Kieran first, so he had no, they'd take him by surprise, mm -hmm. or take him first after lunch, yeah. or, or, or afterwards. And then they would come in and get him. Can, can I move you on just, <coughs> Although Kieran died on the 81 hunger strike, he was also on the 1980 hunger strike, as, as you obviously know. Um, how did he break, or maybe you don't know the answer to this, but how did he break the news to the family that he was going to embark on a hunger strike? Did, was it a surprise to you? Was it, you know, did you see it coming? Uh, yeah. uh, well, Kieran, I mean, knew uh, he was a very determined guy and he was very well got within his comrades, within the, the case. But no, how we found out was he wrote a letter home to the family, uh, more or less saying that he was going on the hunger strike and he was looking our backings. And if we weren't prepared the backing, that he actually didn't want to visit, you weren't going to get a visit, you know what I mean? If you weren't going to stand behind him 100%, he was going to, say no more visits and he wanted people to support him mm. and the family did support him oh absolutely you know 100 yeah. percent. you were going to say uh, michael i uh, it was no surprise he it sent he said he didn't say in the visit but he sent a comment to say that he would have been going to hunger strike this is the first hunger strike yeah the 80 hunger strike and, yeah. and he said to my mother and father would you give me your assurance because he didn't know how the first, first hunger strike was going to go would you would you give me and the second one would you please give me your assurance that you'll stand by my wishes 
even if I lapse into a coma, please give me assurance. I'm a mother and father. Give him that assurance that they would stand by him. And, and that must have been incredibly hard uh -huh. for your mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. It must have been like, you just, you know, such a decision to have to make. The 1980 hunger strike ended the way we all know it ended. It ended by the British government going back on promises that they had made, uh -huh. even simple promises they had made. At the end of that 80 hunger strike, he, I, he, was, he certainly had been weakened by hunger strike. Did it weaken his determination? Oh no, no, no. He, he, he was there to support his comrades. He was there, to, he was in hunger strike for his comrades, and, for, and not just for his comrades, for, for everybody. You know, he, he, he was a very determined guy, and once he went on, as I said earlier on, about his wee bits in his life, when he done wee things like the swimming, the cycling, the football as he was young, playing the field, younger than the old ones, he was determined to get the ball, he was determined to finish things. When he went on hunger strike, we knew he was determined and he would finish that. Did you, and this is hard question, and it's all these questions are looking back on things and time, time changes perceptions. Was there, was there a point where you just kind of realised that Kieran could die here? Did, did it reach that early on? Did it reach that point? Me personally, you've seen the people dying. I never thought it would come to Kieran. Kieran was down the line a bit. This will get sorted out. Yeah. He'll not die. Yeah. It'll be over by the time. There were sweet glimmers every now and then that there may be a, a softening talks. We were meeting up in the the, the Green and Lodge Hotel. I don't know if it was naivety or whatever it was with me, but I thought he would have survived. Mm -hmm. I thought it would have ended. When I got closer to the time, and he was, the days rolled on, when you, uh, he wasn't going to survive. I was heavily involved in the hunger strike, and it, it wasn't naivety in your case, or in my part, it was hope. You mm. hoped that, that there would be no more death. You hoped that yeah. you know it would be resolved. It could have been resolved so many times. So yes, did, had you a sense, Michael, that that, he, that when he started the eighty-one hunger strike, that, yeah. he, that it might lead to his death, or in fact, it would lead to his death? Yes. Uh, well, we we hoped that it wouldn't lead to his death, but no one cared. I, I committed, and what he said is. He sort of he said after the first hunger strike, when it was called off after 15 days, 53 days, and the British reneged on the commitments, he says they rubbed their noses in it. They got after five years on the on the blanket men in five years, they were on a high, they thought it was over, and then the British took them right down, right down there to demoralize them. He says, by God, they're not going to do that again to me. I am not going to give up unless it's set in the five demands are in concrete. And it's not just the five demands. They're trying to break the Republican movement. So he says, they say the five demands or I am going to die. We talked about hope just there. Both of us, we all talked about this, the, the mm -hmm. aspect of hope that came into there. Wasting that a resolution could have been, could have been found. The election in Manor and South Tyrone was one of those periods where the British government, and in fact the government in the South, could have ended the strike by by simple actions. When Kieran got elected, was that the first of all? Did you expect him to get elected? Well, I don't think any. I don't think anybody did. You know, and it was uh, at the tremendous base the republicanism that people supported him, and. Uh, we we ourselves all travelled down yes, to Monaghan and then counties to uh, help with the elections and uh, yes we thought certainly yes we thought the Irish government with him being a TD would have stepped in somewhere along the line. My mother travelled down to Leinster House to speak to the government at the time, but to no avail. She was made set out said for mm -hmm. a, a, a time. You know, instead of bringing her in, you know, and, and my mother never, my mother was a family woman. She never had that, you know, she, w she wasn't one for traveling. She'd done this on her own too, you know what I mean? She, she, people drove her, drove her to these places and she got down and she spoke 
and she spoke very well. Oh, you know, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for you know, sorry, I'm just getting a little bit. Um, well, let me let me ask uh, Michael the same question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, when Karen, the stood nine of uh, hunger strikers and, and and political prisoners in the south, and uh, uh, well, we travelled up and down and the turns and my wife Betty. Yeah. Betty would actually spoke at in some of them the town markets and stuff. Uh, the people of, that's when we first met Quaven O'Keelan, uh, director of elections and Charlie Boyle, he was a election agent. And uh, uh, I remember Quaven organising his troops and uh, nothing was, no stone was left and turned. The work, people of Monaghan Cabin worked day and day from, they took care into his, their heart. Absolutely. Their heart. And Cairn actually afterwards says he took them to his heart and he was overwhelmed by their support. Uh, they said it would maybe get three, four thousand votes. You get nine thousand one, one hundred twenty-three votes. And I remember standing outside a Cavan courthouse, and we were euphoric. It was fantastic. And then when I went into Cairn, he says, "Cairn, your TD." Everybody says they can't let they can't let him die. And Cairn says, "Michael, I would put no trust in them because of the way they're treating our prisoners in Port Leash." And that they were in hunger. Some of them were in hunger strike as well. He says, "So don't don't put all, don't raise your hopes too." But he was sensible. He says, "Don't raise your hopes too much." You mentioned your mother there, and and on occasions, I have to say everybody should refer to their mother or their wife or their sisters as ladies. But your mother was a lady in every sense of the word. Um, to watch her been treated so badly, both by sections of the establishment and also by sections of the church. It must have been very difficult for the family. Well it was when like when she went to Linster at that time, for for knowing that her, her son was down on hunger strike and for the government at the time to sit and just let her, you know, sit there for hours in the end before they actually spoke there and stuff. And it, it, it is hurting, it, you know, I remember my mum being in the house and I was very close to my mum. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, this, this, to see her in stress like that back in them days, you know, worrying about Karen and stuff like that there, it was hard. Michael, you mentioned that during the election campaign in uh, Cabin and Monaghan, that you had travelled down to work in the election to help get Karen elected and all of that. Yeah. Your mother also was part of a campaign to influence people to uh, support and the hunger strike. Was uh, that a difficult period for you? Uh, yes, my mother, uh, it was heartbreaking for my mother and for us too, but it was a bigger pressure for my mama uh, uh, because of her son, it was a son, not a brother, a son. Uh, she worked tirelessly. Absolutely. She worked tirelessly. She attended the meetings, spoke at major rallies, and she actually was never out of the country in her life. And she went to Paris. That's right. She went to Paris and to speak there. So for a woman who has never even had a passport or out of the country in her life, she went there to try to save her son, and she tried everything in her power that would save her son. And she just hoped up to the last day that she could save him. So she was fighting for his life. Can I, can I take you, Terry, just, just back a, a wee bit and all of that? And you mentioned you mentioned that determination that Kieran had, right? yeah. uh, and all things and all things that he done. And as I said earlier on, I knew your father. We've talked a lot about your mother, and your father was. If for anybody didn't know him, I don't know what size he was, but he was. He seemed to be a giant. Mm -hmm. a tall man and very what was your father's personality what was was your father a determined person as well how was he well he, he was a stern person it's uh, growing up in the house you know he, he had rules mm. and all, you know you, you had your chores to do you had stuff and, and through your life you knew not to mess about with him you know <laughs> type of thing you had to put him in place, like, yeah. uh, again, coming, 
he stood by my mum. Uh, my mum my was brilliant, as Michael says, travelling the length and breadth. My father wouldn't have been, my father would prefer to stay in the background yeah. and uh, back my mother. And yeah, he, 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 during the hunger strikes, very determined, very determined to back Kieran, very determined to back mum. Uh, certainly, uh, as a father, he he, 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 he wasn't a parent or anything like no, that. Right. He was a he, he was he was a father, and anything he done, he he done for us, yeah. you know. And uh, like he was he was a good man. He was a good father. I asked you earlier on to tell me a wee bit about. Uh, and this may surprise you, but Kieran, uh, when he was growing up, and you mentioned his sporting achievements and his sporting uh, activity and his determination. Um, I talked to someone again who was at school with him, and he, he said he was remarkably bright. He was very quick, and if he had an interest in something in school, he picked it up very quickly. Uh, does that surprise you, or did you always know that he was a very bright individual? Yes, well, uh, yes. Well, I always knew he was bright, uh, and uh, 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 proved that when he, he was able to become, he never did Irish at school, and he picked, he, he was fluent speaker in the blocks, and, and uh, he won the, the had a, a chess competition, uh -huh. a chess competition yeah. in, the, in the blocks. Here in Nugent, and here Nugent made chess the figures out of paper and scratch them on the floor and give the, the moves down the wing. Kieran was. He, w he was, he was very bright, but it maybe didn't come through to later on. Mm -hmm. He matured as 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 intelligence not matured. Uh, I think well, he, in the early days he was, was very fit. He, he he achieved GSEs at school and stuff, but he became it, it matured later. And uh, you were just saying about my daddy. My, in the early days, my daddy would have been fairly strict person. Yeah. When we were young, growing up, or fairly strict, we wouldn't have stepped out of line. Well, I think you probably needed to be strict we used to. <laughs> you were going to say that you, you, what Michael said in terms of Kieran, that your your view of him as well. If he pick, if he wanted to pick something up, he would do it. But growing growing up, um, it was no different from me doing homeworks and stuff. We sat at uh, the kitchen table, and my dad came in and checked our homeworks. Blah blah blah. You know, it was. To, to me, I was never going to be an academic, you know what I mean? I knew my, where I was going to finish up. I, I was always good with my hands. Kieran also was good with his hands. He actually done a plumbing course in Felton House. Mm -hmm. And before the, the actual troubles, before he got involved, he was actually going to Felton House uh, doing a plumbing course. And that's the line he was going into. And as Michael says, as time went on, you've seen that he, is, he, he, he was an, an intelligent guy. You know, and he, he did know where his, where he was going in life. You know, the, the purpose, and we're almost finished. You'll be glad to hear. But the purpose of this conversation was to show those who watch it. The how those men and women who embarked on hunger strike, how they may they may just, they may well have done heroic things, but they were ordinary people. Yeah. And the more I listen to the two of you talk about Kieran, he wasn't an ordinary person. The more I listen to you, he was someone who was very single focused, someone who uh, had a sense of where he was going and more importantly, had a sense of what needed to be done. When the election, uh, the Kevin Monaghan election and the advice that he gave you uh -huh. The election doesn't change a whole lot. When when that seemed to be the case, and it seemed to be the inevitability that that he may well die on hunger strike. How do you deal with that? Uh -huh. I mean, your brother's in jail. Well, he's uh, dying. Yeah. How do you, or does the yeah. does the the situation just carry you through, or, or how do you uh, deal on it? Well, uh, uh, Karen took a bad spell. Uh, about 50 odd days, so yeah, right, yeah. we were privileged to be with him the last 16 days and, eight, days and nights. And uh, me and my father would have did the nights, and Terence, my mommy, and sisters would during the day. So I was with him 16 nights 
with it, me and Alfie were with him 16 nights. Uh, it's a heartbreaking the mode of time, and uh, it was and uh, when it, it was a very emotive time, and but we were able to get him with them to give him comfort and love. So yeah, uh, and then uh, as the hunger strike, as the days went on, he got weaker and weaker, and he would have stopped drinking his pints of mm. hide and spring water. Mm. And uh, he was, what's in my memory is, is the striped pajamas on his bony frame. frame. And, and then we had to lift him, if he was in pain or that, we had to lift him gently up on, on the bed. And then maybe put a pillow under the sheet to keep it off, off his legs. And his hands were sort of turned black and his lips were, were cracked, but we wouldn't let you put fasting on them. And he said a few things. Those things are rats in my mind. Now he said a few things. It's just a, a straight step forward, a step the other side. I think I'm going to beat Torrance McSweeney. And uh, he said, and he would have said, talked about Sean. He says, we was Sean when he died. That was Sean McDermott. Mm. And he did see a photograph of her popping pot. And he says, I like that. I like that. So that showed you the, pers the person oh. he, he wa was. Can, can it, and you done the days with your mommy, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was equally as difficult for you. Yeah, well, it was. Uh, as it just Michael, it's just a read of what Michael says there. Uh, we were there for him, nursing him, giving him water when he needed water, uh, just sitting by his bed, listening to him, talking. I mean, I remember one. At the at the very start when we came in uh, on Saturday on sixteen days, he picked up a bit, and he was able to actually he was speaking very well, and the actual Michael you you said something in Irish to him and he corrected your grammar, you know, and this is the first time I've ever heard our Karen speaking Irish, you know, during 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 the 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 the, 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 the no voice protests, the we we didn't get up too often to see him. Over the over that period, because my mum and dad Did took the visits yeah. and his girlfriend Jeremy yeah. Shias, they, they got the privileges of going up mostly. Yeah. Yeah. And over that period of time, I think I only seen them about four or five times. Uh, and then then them days that we spent with them, them last few days, you know, it was it was a great. Be, what I said it was it was great to hold his hand. It was great. To, it was a privilege to be his brother. I want to ask you both one last question, but before I ask you any question, I'm very mindful how difficult this conversation has been to both of you, uh, and Betty's here, uh, I know it's very difficult for all of you, and I want to thank you for, for putting yourselves, or allowing me to put yourselves through that. Outside of the hunger strike, and outside of, of all the stuff that happened, if you had one memory of, of Kieran, I'm going to ask both of you the same question. If you had one memory of him, did you want to leave this interview with, what would it be? Terry, so you first. It's determination. The way it was always his determination. Um, mm -hmm. No matter what he took on, he seen it through. And as a, as a, a brilliant brawler, you know, j j just a lovely, a lovely brawler. Michael? Uh, I just feel so humbled that Karen was my brother, the bravest brother, greatest brother ever. How could you have such a, a, a son of Ireland uh, give everything? But memory outside all that, uh, maybe playing on the, the green field, uh, playing Gaelic football up the side of the mountain, and Karen catching a high ball, that, maybe that was outside the hunger strike. Maybe that's that's my memory of one of the last memories that have stuck in my mind about him. I think that question should finish this interview. But can I just make a, a personal a personal point? And, and we know the bravery of the hunger strikers, uh, and we know the sacrifice that they made, uh, and we know the torment that they went through. Quite often, there's an untold story in all of this, and it is the heroism of the family, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers and sisters. Those people who knew right from wrong, 
and who stood by the people and by the wishes their their loved ones asked them to keep. So from me to you, Gorimila Mavit, thank you very much. Thank you. So,